phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Assistant Professor of Sociology at Virginia Commonwealth University, faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, author of two books, Thick and Other Essays, and Lower Ed, The Troubling Rise of For-Profit Colleges in the New Economy. Tressie uh, McMillan Cotton, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Sam. So I, you know, um, the 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 for profit uh, college stuff uh, fascinates me, and um, and you the way in which you came about to to write uh, of the for profit um, uh, college university world is also uh, pretty mm-hmm. fascinating. <laughs> just I mean, just let folks know, um, you know, uh, how 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 you decided to focus mm-hmm. on that. Well, it's a, yeah, the story is uh, probably less about how I decided to focus on it and why and it was possible for me to be doing this project. And I probably started this in like 2010, um, that I seemed to be the only one who kind of wanted to do this project. Uh, and I think that is about uh, my personal experience of the for-profit college sector. But I also think that speaks to the fact that there are so few people like me who had ever touched that sector of higher education who were also in that traditional academic world. And so what happened was I was in graduate school, and listen, Sam, I was going to do anything but this project. I wanted to actually study Ronald Reagan, if you can believe that, Mm -hmm. and instead end up doing this project because uh, as I was working on my uh, doctoral work, for-profit colleges were experiencing this uh, phenomenal boom of enrollment. They were taking in billions of dollars every year from the federal student aid system. And when you start talking about numbers in the billions, people tend to start paying attention. And there was a lot of media scrutiny. There was some growing political scrutiny of the for-profit college sector. But to my mind, there had not been sort of a critical engagement with not just why for-profit colleges were so profitable or so popular, but about who they were enrolling. And I knew a little bit about who they were enrolling and why that mattered because I had, before I had gone to graduate school, I had worked in a for-profit college sector myself as an enrollment officer. And so my experience of it was shaped very much by understanding that not everybody was vulnerable to the for-profit college machine and also that it was a machine and that we probably needed to better understand why millions of people all woke up at one time and decided that they wanted to pursue a college credential at all costs and when you went to the for-profit college sector at all costs was the key term and 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 it and it was almost i mean literally at one time in 2000 um you had about 400,000 people uh, enrolled in mm-hmm. these for-profit colleges by now mm-hmm. it's over 2 million is my understanding so uh, let's um just give us a sense of what what we're talking about because you you mm-hmm. you, you you know you have two different types broadly speaking that you mm-hmm. you, you discuss the 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 right. uh, and you generalize it by calling the beauty school and the mm-hmm. um uh, the uh, t- uh, technical i guess it is wait i right. had it right here right. um and so um tell us what this is and and how mm-hmm. their funding mechanism works Right. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, do, I use these as two archetypes, and I had experience in actually what I call both of the subsectors of for-profit colleges. So one of the things that I think kind of got lost in our lumping all of the institutions together was a misunderstanding that two different sort of phenomena were happening. So on the one hand, you had what had been the sort of historical role of for-profit colleges, which was they mostly provided career technical certification and training, right? And so that was the certificates that you need that were just probably below a college degree, maybe even below a two-year degree, but that you needed to become a certified in an occupation. So that is a mechanics training, cosmetology school. Those had grown out a little bit into things like what we once used to call maybe secretarial programs and now tend to think of broadly as like, you know, administrative or business assistant programs. And then this growth into the healthcare sector. And so things like um, a certified nursing assistant. That's all of these sort of short term credentials usually take you less than two years to complete them, but that are necessary requirements for work. I group those under like the beauty college paradigm in my book. And those are a little different in the incentives that people have for attending those schools are a little different than those that are happening in what I call the technical college system, which is the sector that I think most of us were more familiar with in the mid, you know, first decade of the 2000s, because these were the ones that had all the television commercials, right? Right. Stringer University, the University of Phoenix, 
um, uh, Capella, uh, and all of those. So these were programs that were starting an overreach that was historically new. They had started reaching into the four-year degrees and beyond. They are offering graduate degrees in things like clinical psychology um, and nursing and healthcare. They were offering bachelor's, master's, doctorate degrees, and the incentives for people to pursue those degrees were related to the other part, but they were not exactly the same. And the real growth in the sector, while a lot of it did happen in that beauty college sector, the real growth and the real money, right. the real money, the investment from uh, the private sector, the investment from shareholders and private equity firms, the financial sector was really interested in the growth of that four-year degree and beyond the technical college sector, as I call it, in the book. So uh, on one hand, we have sort of um, what I, you know, uh, you, one could consider a sort of almost a vocational school. Uh, on, right, on some right. level. And the other is this sort of new animal that and we're talking mm-hmm. about Fortune 500 companies here. We're talking right. Yes, I mean, we're yes. talking hundreds mm-hmm. of hundreds of millions of dollars per, uh, mm-hmm. you know, in, in terms of revenue per uh, you know year right. on these country, uh, these uh, companies. Um, and mm-hmm. and that's really where on, on some level, like the 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 action is right. I mean, uh, right. Uh, in, in that sector. And um, it's fascinating to me because you really I mean, I, I I'm quite familiar with sort of some of the the dynamics, uh, but you mm-hmm. uh, look beyond the dynamics and look at what's going on in society that that sort of like bring mm-hmm. that about. But before we get to that part, right. um, w- walk people through the the business model of a place mm-hmm. like one of these technical or what you call technical right. uh, side schools, because it is um, it's. I don't want to say it's a criminal syndicate in my estimation, but um, it's um, it's it's close. (laughs) It's I mean, it is the it is close to being the underside of financialization, which is what I would kind of think of it. You know, it is it is not unlike what we saw happening in the uh, mortgage crisis. Um, Yeah, not unlike what we are uh, starting to see in the student loan debt crisis. And those things are very much related. And that is that. Uh, capital looks for something to invest in. And as consumers become stretched and can't do as much consumer buying, right, what becomes profitable are the things that people have to pay for. Now, that's the social part. And so one of the things I'm looking at in the book is, you know, why did all of a sudden everybody need or want a college degree? What was it that was so attractive to the investment class about this four-year degree and beyond sector that made it so very profitable? Uh, That system looks like looking at what is going on in the economic system and the economic structure. Here we talk about the labor market, but also people, how how comfortable or how safe people feel in the economy. What the system is really preying on is how vulnerable people feel in the labor market. Vulnerability became extremely profitable to the for-profit college sector as a solution. It positioned itself as a solution to workers who are feeling economically vulnerable in the labor market. If you thought that your wages were stagnant, which we now know to be empirically true, people's wages have stagnated over the last 25 years. If you thought your consumer purchasing power had declined, well, you weren't crazy. It had declined. But instead of responding to those things with what we maybe would have done you know, 40 years ago with a sort of social policy response, what we told millions of people was, this is your fault. This is because you're not competitive enough for the new jobs of the 21st century. The only way to prove that you are competitive is to get a degree and to keep pursuing credentials and degrees and and to do that at your own individual cost. And you call this the uh, education gospel. That is correct. It is the gospel that says it doesn't matter what the reality of the economic relationship is, because it is predatory, as you point out. It is preying on predatory in the true sense of the word, which is that it's preying upon people's economic vulnerabilities. Um, uh, The education gospel says don't worry about those details. Don't worry about what the economic relationship is or the details of the contract you're signing. Education will always pay off because it has always paid off. We were so invested in the gospel that education could never fail you that I think on the social policy and certainly on the political front, we fell down on asking tough questions about whether or not this specific type of education actually paid off for people. And what we know now is that the picture is not very good for whom that for whom that educational investment is paid off for. For-profit colleges 
are more expensive than uh, your, most of your not traditional uh, most of your traditional not-for-profit college options. Students tend to bear more of the individual costs through student loans, uh, as opposed to say grants and scholarships or employee benefits. They take longer to complete those programs, and as it turns out, the labor market doesn't seem to reward it in higher wages. All right. So um, let's talk about um, about well. We, we should also say that something like when you talk about the, the schools that you mentioned, these, um, uh, these bigger um, uh, for-profit universities, which are also predominantly online, right? Um, mm-hmm. we're, we're talking about ni- something like 95% of their tuition costs are paid mm-hmm. via student loans mm-hmm. from the U.S. government, right? Mm-hmm. And... But legally, it's supposed to be a. We have this 90/10 rule, right? What for, what for-profit colleges are held to is the standard that ni- only up to 90% of their tuition can come from the federal student aid program, and the other 10% is supposed to come from direct tuition payments from either employers or from students. What this is supposed to do is, you know, what this is, uh, how this is um, described is a, a check on the school's uh, value to the consumer. But 90%, first of all, is still extremely high, and it's only 90% in theory. Because what we have found is that many schools, that doesn't include things like GI Bill money, is usually counted in that 10%. And so some institutions, when you count up all of the government subsidized payments coming to them, approach something far closer, to, as you said, to the 95%, coming from publicly subsidized dollars. All right, and so give us a sense of, of uh, demographically, who these students mm-hmm. tend to be, their age, mm-hmm. um, uh, right. their background, because right. they're, 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 a lot of these students are similarly situated, right? They're, they're ambitious, right. but they mm-hmm. also don't necessarily have the, the, the social, um, the, the, the social cash, uh, cash, uh, or, uh, the, um, the networking, to mm-hmm. uh, you know, enter into what we you know traditional uh, higher ed uh, schools or be aware, mm-hmm. or they 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 can't they can't afford to because they've got to take care right. of their children or uh, they have exactly. other responsibilities. Exactly, I think the real telling statistic in uh, the for-profit college sector's uh, demographics. Uh, is in gender, actually. And in the book, I talk a lot about race, class, and gender, but I really think gender is the biggest piece because it tells, I think, exactly that story, Sam, which is this. About 68, anywhere between 68 and 74 percent, depending on which year you take it, and this hasn't changed much over the last 10 years, of those enrolled in the for-profit college sector are women, right? Um, This is really a gendered problem that I think really speaks to why people would attend these schools. People are attending them mostly because they are, one, have already been disadvantaged in the paid labor market. We know all of the general statistics and trend lines of how much more credentialed women have to be to be paid equal salaries in the labor market, how much more difficult it can be for them to have upward mobility into higher income positions. But we also know that bigger story that women tend to be the ones more likely to be caring for children. Um, and when you're talking about the age range of the student, this is we tend to think of them as, quote unquote, non-traditional. But that just means doesn't always necessarily mean they're older. It usually just means that they are caring for also caring for a child. Um, but when you're talking about people in that position, they're also more likely to be caring for parents. This is a very familiar story mm-hmm. for many of us trapped between caring for children and caring for aging parents. And their economic position then not need, needs to not only take care of themselves, but they are really trying to take care of a whole family, right? And so when they are having problems moving up or are getting secure employment in the labor market, they are especially vulnerable to a message that sounds like this. Call today, start school tomorrow, get a degree fast, get a better paying job almost immediately, because that's the message, right? Call today, start tomorrow, change your life. Well, that's the message that would be more attractive to people for whom changing their life means changing the lives for their children, for their elderly parents, et cetera. And that's women. Uh, And then when we move from there, of those enrolled in the for-profit college sector, they are more likely to be African-American, Hispanic, low-income students. That's not to say that men don't attend, and they certainly do. It's not to say that white students don't attend. But when we're looking at, like, the typical face, the next time your uh, listeners are maybe looking at those commercials, it's a really good indicator when you look at who they put in the commercials. Right. Right. They're overwhelmingly women who are talking about they're going to do their homework while their kids are asleep. 
that's because that tells you who they know their ideal typical student is. And those those people are particularly vulnerable to that message and are especially vulnerable to taking on student loan debt to pay for that kind of chance. And and we should say that when the my understanding of it is and 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 walk me through this, but the there's a quality that reminded me um, in the way that they get paid uh, mm-hmm. that reminded me of of working in commercial radio. The key to commercial radio mm-hmm. was always you want to hold people over the first you know the ne- the next quarter hour. If you could get uh-huh. them past uh-huh. that, and there's a there's there's a dynamic in these schools that is like this based upon the schedule mm-hmm. in which student loans are di- uh, dished out. Is that right? That is correct. So the goal um, of the em- of the enrollment machine that I talk about in the describe in the book um, is to get students enrolled as quickly as possible. The idea being that the more time and the more opportunity students have to reflect on their decision, the more likely you are to lose them. Right. So you wanted to get them when they called, you want them to get, come in immediately to sign their paperwork and to get their federal financial student aid application completed as quickly as possible. And I mean, we're talking in many cases within a week, um, which sounds very odd to those of us who went through like the traditional college system. So that's why I want to put some, some numbers on this. We're not talking weeks or months. We're talking you call on a Tuesday, you visit on a Wednesday, you're enrolled when you leave Wednesday and your financial aid paperwork is done by that Friday. Then the next goal there is to get them started in a class as quickly as possible. Depending on when you make that phone call, what we call rolling enrollment dates are going on, meaning there's almost always a new class starting. You're rarely waiting more than two weeks to start in the next class. And that was important because the federal student aid system will not pay the tuition until they have what we call butt in seat, right? The student's butt needs to be in the seat. They've got to show up on that first day of class and the uh, attendance during that first three weeks of that first month of school is critically important because that's how the student is then counted for student aid purposes before the check is sent, right? And then the money, the lion's share of that tuition enrollment comes up front. There's, there's certainly other dollars that come as the student continues on in school, but the student is quite valuable there at the earliest part mm. of that process for that reason. And then and then it, the it, retention becomes an important metric for these schools, right? Because they because, want that second check. Right, right. Not even so much completion because there's no bonus for like getting right. the students completed. There can be a penalty for them not completing, but it is about making sure they are there through the, the deadline, the cutoff deadlines for the student aid payment. And so... Wh- when you were working in in admissions, like how much, what kind of data did they provide you with in terms of return mm-hmm. on investment? Uh, that's what t- sort of fascinates um, me because I, I I feel money. like I feel like if these schools, uh, they my understanding is they take a tremendous amount of of data about their students mm-hmm. as a way of mm-hmm. of sort of like how do we market to them. How do we keep them in the seats? How do we get them in the seats? Mm-hmm. How do we keep? And we're being we're being um, uh, metaphorical with the seats, right? Because they could theoretically right. be doing it online. Right. Um, but but uh, what you never see is seventy five percent of our students end up making thirty percent more two years out mm-hmm. after graduation, mm-hmm. or some figure like that, which right. would be that's the key metric, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It is. And now this is where I kind of want to be fair. We don't actually have a good metric on that for any of higher education. The problem is it's it's probably less of a problem if you went to a traditional not-for-profit college, right? So we haven't had to be as dogged about that kind of data. That's actually, I think, one of the weaknesses in our um, data system that for-profit colleges have exploited. Um, The fact that we have not had great data on employment returns for all students has made it pretty easy for the for-profit college sector to say, well, hey, it's not like we're falling down the job. Nobody has this data. They're right. They're just not being, they're just not, uh, they're just not, don't have the right motivation when they say that. Um, we do not have excellent data on um, how much a student earns after they graduate. Some of that is the uh, federal system's fault. Some of that is the for-profit college sector's fault. What I will say is I talk to people who manage the marketing data at for-profit colleges, and they have better data than what is often publicly available to us I bet. about how these students are doing. It is that they are not compelled to release it, and it, they do not release it and use it in their marketing materials to the students 
what was more common was for us to slide this um, disclosure agreement across to the students that the uh, that the U.S. Department of Education has required for-profit colleges to do. They have to usually provide things like disclaimers about um, your student loan debt. They have to provide disclaimers about the graduation rate and their job placement data. But that usually looks something like this. It was usually about how much people in this type of job would earn. What they didn't usually break it out to say was this is how much people in this job who got their degree from us have earned. So for example, you would say, hey, I want to get a, a certificate in, you know, electrical engineering. Um, and we'd say, all right, we offer that degree program. Here's what people with an electrical engineering certificate earned last year, according to the Occupational Outlook Handbook. That's what we would tell them. But we did not separate out and break out, but this is how much students who earned their degree with us are making right. in said jobs. And that's a level of like, finesse that very few people have to push back against the college to ask for that level of detail. And 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 and, and you say that you uh, you're convinced that these um, institutions, as it were, have uh, data mm-hmm. on on what the return on investment mm-hmm. is, at least to some extent. And mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's fairly obvious that if it was gangbusters, we'd know about it. Right. I mean, oh, yeah, that's what I've always said to them. If it's great, awesome, right? Like you should definitely lead with that information. I've certainly said the same thing. Right. Um, and, and they are admittedly, there are some smaller programs and some for-profit colleges that do do extremely well, often because they are attached to other type of um, arrangements, right? Right. They have a direct line, for example, like they're training people to work at AT&T and AT&T has agreed to hire X amount of people. That's just, but those are anomalies for the most part. Most of the students who are going through these sort of generalized degree programs are relying on employers to decide whether or not their their degree means something. Um, and because of that, they're usually competing with people who have degrees from other places, uh, and their wages often do not look comparable. Um, and I, I suspect that if the for, most for-profit colleges had data that says that they were doing that significantly better than average, they would certainly advertise it. I would imagine even if they're doing average, they would advertise it is my guess. But I mean, I'm not a marketing guy, so I don't know. But um, <laughs> but but and we should say, I mean, just to be fair, I've heard of some programs where um, you, you come in and they will um, y- your fee. You don't even pay until mm-hmm. you make back uh, a certain percentage of, of your income. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are programs that are set up mm-hmm. better. And, and I think uh, some of these uh, I think folks associated with it are striving to mm-hmm. in, in certain instances. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, give me a sense of, of what the people working there like how much was your awareness as you were sitting there mm-hmm. saying like, you know, this seems a little weird uh, that right. we're not talking about a return on investment, which is mm-hmm. why everybody walking through the door is here. Right. Like, you know, right, at, right. A, that is. At, yep. a not, at a not for profit school, uh, some schools, you know, some liberal arts schools, you know, people are there mm-hmm. for citizen, you know, to be I want to be a better citizen or, you know, right. I, I don't have to mm-hmm. worry about my finances or whatever mm-hmm. it is. Uh, but clearly, right. most of the people walking through that door are like, I'm here because mm-hmm. in two years, I want to be making 30 percent more right. than I'm making today. Right. What, yeah. what? And that is absolutely fair. I mean, the for-profit colleges themselves say of their marketing data that the number one reason that their prospective students and enrolled students tell them that they enrolled in school or sought out school with them, it was to earn more money immediately. Right. So that I mean, I mean, the students tend to be making a very sort of rational economic exchange when they attend a for profit college in a way that is less true um, in traditional, especially uh, on campus four year degree programs that we have this sort of broader, like you said, liberal arts mission and where the value of college can then be a bit more subjective. Um, I remember feeling that, I mean, I had gone to traditional colleges myself, as did a few of my colleagues there in the enrollment office. So we knew it was different than our own experience. Um, And I remember being troubled by it, and I talk a little about that in the book, but having absolutely no words for describing why I was uncomfortable, right? So these words about things like, uh, you know, social inequality and, um, you know, who who can who can make the uh, sit out the take on the opportunity cost of sitting out the labor market to go back to school. None of us had that language. I will say some of us were less concerned with it than others. But I do like to point out, I think everybody there, save for a few sort of extreme cases, fundamentally thought that the education gospel worked. 
And so right. if we were offering an opportunity for people to better themselves, if it was costing them a lot of money, that was still better than nothing. What Where it did get stickier is that there were admissions people who would say things like, I myself would not go to college this way, right? I wouldn't go to school here, or I wouldn't allow my children to go to school here. But this is still a good option for, quote, unquote, other people. And that's where I thought um, when people felt uncomfortable or were wrestling with those ideas, that's where it usually manifested. Okay, and this is, I mean, it, it, um I mean, that's fascinating because I think there is this sort of uh, of quality of like, you know, I don't know, uh, the, the, the uh, both an ignorance to the, the sort of the reality of what's being offered and sort of mm-hmm. a predisposition to presume there's nothing else that can be done for these folks. Right. And that, that is, is that, let's talk a little bit about that part, because. The, the Obama administration started to crack down on some of this by basically saying you're not eligible for student loans. And, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you're not eligible for student loans uh, unless um, you use specific accrediting uh, companies or certain accrediting values. And um, and, you know, they said to I think it was uh, Corinthian and uh, ITT, like mm-hmm. your creditor, your creditor. That's not real. Uh-huh. We don't buy uh-huh. it. And then their loans dried up and their business dried up overnight and they had to close. Um, mm-hmm. But that was insufficient because why? Well, it doesn't solve the big problem, right? So, uh, you know, we can think of this in our own lives. You know, the grocery store closing down, the the grocery store you really like closest to your home closes down. It doesn't solve the problem that you need groceries, right? The problem, the real root of the problem was the demand, not the supply. Um, And, yeah, and I would point out about these schools that, that did rely significantly on federal student aid dollars. And once they lose their accreditation, you tend to lose then your ability to offer student aid, and that's pretty much the end of usually any uh, for-profit college school, as it would, to be fair, for all schools. Um, But the accreditation fees, the Obama administration uh, was becoming more particular about the data they were requiring the for-profit college to to provide to judge whether or not they were meeting the threshold of providing a quality education. Now, the for-profit colleges, I should say, debate to the death whether or not that's a fair assessment of them, whether they should be held to that standard or not. Um, and whether the metric is fair, but that is what the Obama administration was doing. Um, What I will say is that what the Obama administration and really what no administration has done in quite some time is really wrestle, however, with that bigger problem. There was this recent report that just came out a couple months ago, I think from the Center for American Progress, that said the job skills myth, uh, the job skills have been a myth, right? Well, that's all I was writing about, what many of us have been writing about for some time, that what we have been telling people Uh, the social inequality problem in the labor market was not about people not having the right skills. Um, And instead of solving that problem and being honest in our political rhetoric to say, this is not about employers not having the right skills. This is about employers not wanting to pay fair wages. This is about us not holding employers to task for um, their tax responsibility. There was a lot at play. Um, And I will say that nobody had really hit on the political rhetoric that I think solved the problem of demand. And that was why for-profit colleges remain somewhat popular with people. Demand has not dried up because there's still a demand for a good quality of life with good wages. And they're still making that promise. And, and we should, I, I want to be really explicit about this so people understand. So the, 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 the myth was that there was a mismatch in our workforce mm-hmm. with their education. And uh, all the research now shows a big report came out uh, very recently. I, and I think it was from the Center for Economic uh, um, uh, Progress. Right. But I'm not, I'm, yeah, regardless, right. um, re- regardless, it basically showed that, in fact, what was happening is um, as it became more of a buyer's market for employers, they just got more mm-hmm. narrow in what they would accept uh, right. from people rather than uh, certain skill sets being needed. But mm-hmm. but we're also talking about people who are already employed more often than not, right? Uh-huh. When you're going to these Correct. schools. that's right. These are people who just want that's to right. get better wages and be able that's to right. care for their families. So we have a, right. a, not so much of a lack of employment uh, situation, but mm-hmm. rather poor pay for people right. who are doing decent work. Um, and, that is right. and so we, we had this, 
I mean, on some level, I feel like the educational story in in this sector is not terribly different than when we see education in the context of of, of K through 12, insofar mm-hmm. as we're looking at schools to deal with societal ills that right. are really not exactly. in their portfolio. That is correct. And what these that I mean, that is really the big story and the tougher story, frankly, right? People don't like the story when I say people is, you know, I think it's hard for politicians. I think it's hard for policy people um, to get a good story. We're just so deeply invested in the narrative. But the real story here is that it is not just possible, but now I think we can empirically argue that it is true that colleges cannot and school K through 12 or K through 16 cannot solve these larger social ills that the real problem of wages was never about the human capital of the workers working in jobs. Um, And so when you told people that story, all you did was make them very valuable um, to the financial sector who were able to exploit that fear by selling credentials. But that does not solve the problem that what workers are really facing is a really tough path to not just a good job, but what we would call internal mobility, the promotions over time, for your wages to increase over time when you work at a job and after five years that you should be earning more than when you started. Those kinds of problems are not human capital problems. And and we should say, I mean, there, there, it's interesting what's implicated here because the 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 access to government loans clearly mm-hmm. drove up the prices of these places, right? Because they're just mm-hmm. they're basically fixing their tuition as a function of that ninety ten uh, rule. Like we're we're going to make our uh, we're going to make our our tuition cost ten percent more than whatever is available mm-hmm. uh, for people in terms of of government loans. And, mm-hmm. and that dynamic, of course, would be fixed in, in many respects, reversed if we instead mm-hmm. of having a massive loan um, uh, program, we we provided at least one or two mm-hmm. free options uh, per state. But mm-hmm. that's maybe a separate issue. But. I want to. No, I don't think it's a separate issue. I actually think it's a super important one. Sam. It's one of the ones that I argue for that the real competition, we thought that the competition that needed to happen in the higher education, quote unquote, market was that you needed more institutions. And that's what we saw happen uh, from 1990s to 2010s when we created tons of new institutions. But as long as the student aid system is underwriting all of those institutions the same, that's not actually creating more competition. Um, they would just increase the, the size of the pot and just take in more students. That's what the for-profit college sector really was. Real competition would come through true, accessible, affordable options. And the only people who can do that, the only entity that can do that is the state. Um, and so I actually believe that's the real solution. Interesting. And.